Hey, how you guys doing? Thank you for praying for us. Uh, Billy was talking about flies in the ears, and I was thinking, I don't know if I want to go on this trip anymore. Is it, is it too late to back up? Yeah, Mexican flies or something. No, I appreciate that. That is a very powerful symbol, uh, anointing, and uh, so I appreciate Billy doing that and, and sharing with us that this morning, and you guys praying for us as well. Uh, we're leaving this coming Saturday, and so uh, the team will be gone uh, for seven days down there. And so keep us in prayer uh, throughout our trip every day if you get a, uh, an opportunity. Uh, remember us while we're down there. It's going to be a really, really great time, and I'm expecting a lot of great testimonies to come from that time also. So I can't wait to share them uh, with you when, when we return. Um, I wanted to say a special welcome to everybody here this morning, thank you guys so much for joining us, uh, for being with us this morning. I want to extend a special welcome to those who are uh, those who are single, those who are married, those who are filthy rich, those who are dirt poor, and those uh, no habla ingles. Um, we extend a special welcome to those who are here with crying newborns, those who are skinny as a rail, and also those who could lose a lose a few pounds. We welcome you if you could sing like Andre Bocelli, or if you can't carry a tune in your bucket. Um, and you may already know which one of those two your neighbor is by the song time, you know. Is this the last song? Okay, good. <laughs> uh, you're welcome here if uh, you're just browsing, if you're just checking us out, uh, if you just woke up or if you, you just got out of jail. We don't care if you're more Christian than the Apostle Peter or if you haven't been to church uh, uh, since little Joey's baptism, you know. If you haven't been with us since last Easter or Christmas, uh, we're glad you came back. Thank you. We extend a special welcome to those who are over 60 but haven't grown up all the way yet. Uh, but also, well, wait, hey, a section over there. We also welcome those who are teenagers who are growing up just a little bit too fast, you know. Hey, holler on that section. We welcome soccer moms and NASCAR dads and starving artists and tree huggers and latte sippers and vegetarians and junk food eaters. We welcome those who are in recovery and those who are still addicted. We welcome you if you're having problems or if you're down in the dumps or if you don't like organized religion all that much because we've been there too. If you blew all your offering money at the casino, you're still welcome. We offer a special welcome to those who think the earth is flat, that they work too hard, that don't work at all. Those who can't spell, those who are gay, those who are here just because grandma's in town and she wanted to go to church. We welcome those who are inked and who's are pierced and those who are both. We offer a special welcome to those who use prayer right now, to those who had religion shoved down your throat as a kid, to those who got lost in traffic and just kind of wandered in the room. We welcome those who are staying in the hotel and heard the music and joined us here today. We welcome tourists and seekers and doubters and bleeding hearts, and we also welcome you. Welcome to Epic, a church for the rest of us. Today, uh, we are wrapping up a series, and we wanted to offer this special welcome to let you know that you are a part of this journey. You are a part of where we are going. And you may say, hey, bro, I, this is my first day. I don't know you, and you don't know me, and I don't know where you're going. Uh, you've actually picked a great Sunday to be here because you're going to hear where we are headed to. Uh, we've been recapping what God has been doing in the church up into this, uh, to this point. Uh, we are a church that's 11 years old. We started in September 2005. Uh, God has moved us uh, to a few different locations and all in the same zip code. Uh, and God has done great things from our inception to now. Uh, but we believe our best days are ahead of us. Amen. I believe the best is yet to come, and so we wanted to say welcome, and hopefully you find this place as a home and this church as a family, this group of people as a family. Uh, we are misfits. We don't all uh, agree and look alike and think alike and act alike, and we all have varied pasts, uh, but we are a family, just like most families are. We all look different, act different, think different, uh, but God has called us to be a church and a family together, and we wanted to say welcome home to you. Uh, today we are finishing up. Our series called This Is Us. Um, and as I mentioned, if you're a first-time guest with us this morning, I'm glad you are here. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad you're here because you're going to be able to hear our heart. You're going to be able to hear where we are going. There may be parts uh, of today that I'm going to talk about things that necess aren't necessarily relevant to you quite yet. Uh, but you are going to get a glimpse of our heart, of our passion. You're going to get a glimpse of where we feel God is taking us. And you're going to get to see the mission of this church, of this house up close and personal. Uh, church for the rest of us to all 
come to life. Come into life is the work that God wants to do in you through us as a church. Uh, I don't know where you are in the game. I don't know where you are, uh, what steps you've already taken in the journey. You may need to, uh, you may need to know God for the very first time today. Uh, this is really what we feel God has called us to as a church, these four things. Um, if you don't know God personally, I pray that before this time ends, before I let you leave this room this morning, that you make that decision uh, to, to know him for the first time. You may need to find freedom from your yesterdays, settle all the past that has been haunting you and uh, the secrets maybe that are, that are trying to catch up or maybe the, the things that happened yesterday that are trying to work their way into today. You may need to find freedom, and we hope that you can do that through this church family. We do that a lot through our group time, through, through finding groups and getting into them, and we'll get into that at another date, another time. Maybe you need to discover your purpose, why God put you on this earth, why you were born, why you are here, why you're in Baltimore. You may have got sent here from work, and, and you're at this place, and, and you're like, man, why am I in this city? What, what am I here for? I don't know anyone. Uh, I never thought I'd be over here on the East Coast. Why am I here? We believe God has a purpose for your life, and this moment is a part of that purpose. And so maybe you're at a place where you need to discover your purpose, and maybe it's putting all of those things together to make a difference. Maybe it's understanding that you can know God, that he can free you from your past. He has you here for a purpose. And all of that together is to make an eternal difference in the life of another person. We believe that you coming to life is these four things wrapped up. It's this journey of walking with Christ together. We've been witness here at this church of marriages restored, addictions being broken, lives being changed. Last year we experienced record, number, record numbers of men and women coming to life in Christ. And, and, and uh, it's been amazing. We've been celebrating that in the past few weeks. But we're using this series to answer this question, well, where are we going next? What is ahead for us what is out over the horizon when we look out ahead? Where are we going to? Where, where is God taking us? What is he calling us to? A quick update. Uh, about a year ago, 12 months ago, I stood on the stage and said, I believe God was going to take us into two locations by the year 2020. Uh, we just started 2017, so the countdown is on. Uh, and, and we believe that God is moving behind the scenes to make this happen. Um, and uh, give you a quick update, we formed an expansion team since, since I first mentioned this. This expansion team is made up of the, the, the best and the brightest. Um, these guys and girls around the table just blow me away of their education and experience. Um, and we've been in the process of nailing down uh, our first permanent location because we are portable in, in the best western here. And so we said, hey, we need a home base of operations. We need a place for us to put our roots down uh, that we can, from that location, branch out into the others where we feel God is calling us to. Because two locations we don't feel is, is the end of the game. We feel God is calling Epic to plant campuses all across the city and even beyond. And so we need a home base of operations. So that expansion team is saying, we need uh, uh, that home base. Where is that going to be? And what building is that going to be in? So we've been pouring over maps and, and potential properties in Canton because we feel this is where God has called us to first. Uh, this is where he sent Lori and I when we would drive around down on Thames Street and through Canton before it was actually turned back into this Canton that we see today. And we knew that God was calling us to this location. And so this is where Epic is, has its roots, and this is where the roots are going to stay. But from this place, we're going out into the counties, into the cities, into the highways and the byways to find uh, where God can use us the most and the best. God has sent us into this area to be a light in the darkness, to show the way. We believe that our families and people at a very critical point in their life in, in this area, in this city, even now uh, behind us in O'Donnell Heights where the hotel is, they're a very critical part of their lives, and God has sent us here as a church to point them in the right place. And so I ask you to keep this on your prayer list, this 2K20. Uh, keep praying that God would give us a, a space, a building, whether it's to own, to build, to lease. We don't care. Uh, we want a home base of operations because we believe that the best is ahead. Uh, that God has great things in store for us, and so we're trying to prepare to build our foundation out so we're ready for that. As we keep our eyes open for the places that he's leading us to, we want to continue to be faithful with what God gives us and where he leads and where he directs us. Uh, week one, I talked to you about this uh, in this series of This Is Us. I said, the church that I see is one that faithfully handles what God has given us, what's been given to us, that impacts the world before us and equips the next generation after us. And, and this statement, I believe, encompassed the three areas of strategy that we're focusing on in this coming year. 
And these three areas uh, of strategy we've talked about in the past few weeks, and we're wrapping it up with the last one. Week one, we talked about the next generation, equipping those that are coming after us. Because God forbid when we all pass uh, that they don't understand the gospel and don't know who Jesus is and what good things he's done for them. And so it's our responsibility to pour it into them. Last week, we talked about our city outreach impacting the world before us. And today I want to wrap up talking about a heart for the house, for this room here, this place, a heart for this house. Real quick, I want everybody in the room to close their eyes just for a brief moment. Everybody close your eyes. Do this with me. In your mind, I want you to think of a person that is far from God, maybe someone that doesn't know Christ just yet, someone that needs Jesus in their life, maybe to know him, to find freedom, maybe to just discover their purpose because they're wandering aimlessly, or maybe it's take all the good things that they have and, and just make an eternal difference with them. Uh, I want you to think of at least just one person. Everybody have that person in their mind? Everybody have that person? I'm assuming by that silence that's an affirmative yes. Still, give you two seconds. Okay, everybody got that person? All right, open your eyes. I want you to keep that person in your mind, that name, a specific name. Whoever that person is, hopefully you know someone that's far from God. If you don't, ask your neighbor because there's plenty to go around. Keep that person in your mind because uh, we're going to come back to that in just a moment. I want to jump to a set of scriptures that uh, God has actually changed the way that I viewed it as I was studying this out. It's Acts chapter 9. If you've got a Bible, grab it and turn with me uh, there. Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 1. Um, this, this set of verses you may have heard before, you may have read before. It's a story in the New Testament. It's pretty common. It's about the Apostle Paul, uh, the calling, this Damascus Road experience. Uh, but as I was reading it a few weeks ago, maybe a month and a half ago, God changed the way that I've, uh, I saw it and showed me something in there that I think is going to change actually the trajectory of this body, of, this, of our church. Uh, I believe it speaks to God's vision for us right now. Acts chapter 9, starting at verse 1. It's on the screens if you don't have a Bible with you, but here we go. Verse 1, Acts 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. So this guy is not a friendly dude. We'll get to more of his background in just a moment. So he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way. Now, this is what they've called themselves. This is what we now call Christians. They called themselves followers of the way. Uh, they said if, if he found any that belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners uh, to Jerusalem. Verse 3, as he neared Damascus on his road, on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Verse 5, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. He says, I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Verse 7, the men traveling with him they, uh, traveling with Saul, stood there speechless. They heard the sound but didn't see anyone. So they hear this voice booming from the sky, but they didn't see anything uh, at, at the moment. So Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind. He didn't eat or drink anything. Meanwhile, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. Any Star Wars fans in here? Any Star, Star Wars fans in here? This set of scripture is ver is full of those like George Lucas scene changes. Okay, so this is what happened. Saul's blind. He goes in there. Scene change. You know. Okay. Meanwhile, you see Ananias. He's sitting there. He's eating lunch. The Lord called him and said, "Hey, Ananias." Yes, Lord. He answers. The Lord told him, "Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street." And ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he's praying. In a vision, he's seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. I wish when God talked to me, he was that specific, right? Hey, hey you, I want you to go into this city, and I want you to go to the house of Judas, not Judas on you know, Thame Street or Judas on Broadway. I'm talking about Judas on Straight Street. Oh, right, right, right. I know it's, it's right there. Yeah, Judas on Straight Street. And in there, there's not just any guy. There's a guy from this town called Tarsus. His name is Saul. He's actually praying right now while we're talking. Ananias is like, man, this is weird. <laughs> in a vision, this guy Saul is seeing you, Ananias, Come into the house and pray for him and restore his sight. 
So it's a pretty, uh, you know, open and close case. Well, Ananias, just like the rest of us, he says, whoa, 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 time out, time out. Okay, God, um, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Saul is the guy who's killing Christians. And Ananias is like, okay, I know that, that, that he saw me come in, but is there anybody else that you can show him also, like, it may be Ananias or another guy, because I'm not feeling this, this you know, calling at, at the moment. Verse 13, Lord, uh, Lord, or sorry, verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, go. That was pretty explicit. <laughs> go. Stop running your mouth. You got to go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and he entered it. Now, most of the time when we read this story, we focus on this guy Saul turning to Paul. Um, at the Damascus Road, the bright light, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And, and, and rightfully so because Saul's conversion really changed the game. Um, he, he shaped the history of Christianity and really even changed the face of the globe. Um, even before Paul was a believer, or Saul who turned to Paul was a believer, his actions were very significant. His, his frenzied persecution of the church pushed the Christians or the believers or the followers of the way out in, in to share the gospel outside of Jerusalem like Jesus told him to in, in Acts 1.8. Paul was a very religious guy. His training was under Gamaliel, was un, under the best that could be. He was born a Jew, but his parents were Roman citizens. So Paul had Roman citizenship, which gave him extra rights above everyone else. He wasn't a foreigner in Rome. He was a Roman citizen. So this guy was legit. He was a Pharisee. He trained under the best Gamaliel. He knew the Bible and his cause was sincere. He viewed Christianity as a threat to God's true revelation, which was Judaism. So he persecuted Christians without mercy. Until Paul's conversion, little had been done to carry the gospel to non-Jews. A few uh, isolated instances before of this, but no, none had taken the beautiful message of the gospel outside of Jerusalem with any consequence. The message that God came down to earth as a man to redeem his creation, to have a relationship with those he created, to breathe life once again into them through the cross, the resurrection, and by his spirit he sent. So justly, rightfully so, when we read this story, we're fixated on the conversion of this giant of the faith, Saul, who became Paul. But we often forget about the other characters of the story. One, Ananias, who was told to go visit this violent murderer of Christians, and he's like, hey, time out, God, I don't really want to do this. Anybody ever prayed that before? Hey, God, I, I know you're asking me to do this, but I don't want to. <laughs> uh, he says, I'm no, uh, can you send someone else? But more than Ananias, I want us to focus on Judas, the house of Judas on Straight Street, the meeting place of Jesus' followers and the lost and the blind. What if Judas didn't take Saul in? What if Judas wasn't ready, his house wasn't prepared? Anybody ever had a guest show up and you weren't ready for him? You look out the window, you're like, man, I got underwear, like, thrown on the floor in every room. I don't even know where to go. I'll be right there. You know, I start flew. What if Judas had, was not prepared at all? What if Judas hadn't let Saul in because maybe he heard the threats? What if Judas hadn't had a heart for his own house on Straight Street? What if he missed an opportunity to house a meeting place for Saul and the God of the universe, the miracle of conversion in his living room, the miracle of God calling someone to do great things, the miracle of God meeting man in a moment in time at his house, the house on Straight Street. It staged a meeting place that changed the world. Saul wandered in blind from the truth of who Jesus was. Ananias, who represents us, the church, came in with the power of God. The hands and the feet of Jesus himself left on earth to carry out the mission of bringing kingdom come. The house of Judas on Straight Street played host to one of the greatest conversions in history. Paul would go on to share the gospel with those outside of Jerusalem. He went on three missionary journeys 
all along the Mediterranean Rim, starting churches, the letters that he wrote to those churches and to those pastors and to the people who belong to them are more than two-thirds of the New Testament where you and I get our theology of who Jesus is and what he has done. He would have audiences with the highest officials in the Roman Empire. And it all happened at Judas' house on Straight Street. Like Judas, you and I must have a heart for the house, this house. Because God is sending people through our doors that are blind to the truth of who Jesus is. And what if we missed it? Every Sunday he sends believers and seekers and skeptics in these chairs, on these tiers, in this house. And we must be ready to host a meeting between God and man in our midst. We don't know who they are, where they are in their journey. They could be the next Apostle Paul, Billy Graham, the next Martin Luther, John Wesley. We cannot control who God sends us and what time they come, but we can control the state of this house, the one God's given us. See, the church I see is ready to show life in Christ to everyone and anyone that God sends us at any time. If we keep reading, it says, Ananias, he went into the house, he entered it, Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the, on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again. Whew. Our calling is to show the truth so that people could see again. Because there are scales on our eyes. And anybody remember what it was like to be blind? You were doing everything you thought you knew to be true. It just wasn't working out. You showed up at your job, you clocked in, you went nine to five, you loved your wife and your kids, and you provided a home for them, and you said, it just doesn't seem like it's enough. I can't see the purpose behind this. Ananias walks into the house, he says, God has sent me, Jesus who had just appeared to you has sent me to lay hands on you so that you may see again. And to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, verse 18 says, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, food, he regained his strength. Like the house on Straight Street, God is calling this house to be a house of healing, to be a house of prayer, to be a house where the blind recover their sight. This house is calling to be a meeting place between God and man. To heal the blind that are sent our way is our calling. Those that are blind to why they just can't quit or break the addiction. Those that are blind to why they don't understand why they're always arguing with their spouse. Those that are blind to why they're still searching when they have everything that they need. Those that are blind to the fact of why they don't have God in their lives. Those that are blind to why they are alive, why they are here. Those that need purpose. What if there was no house for Judas? No house for Saul to go and no meeting place. Saul would have been wandering through the streets. Saul would have been wandering around even more lost. He would have been one ticked off Christian killer. Your Jesus made my life even worse. Anybody know someone like that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I know all about your faith. It made my life a living hell. I grew up in it. I know what you're talking about. I sang the songs. I know how they all go. I can name all the 66 books. I can do it. It ruined my life. I don't want anything to do with your religion and your Jesus. Because there wasn't a house of healing. There wasn't a house for them to find the spirit of God to mend their brokenness. But that wasn't the reality. There was a house for Saul and there is a house in Baltimore. It's our calling. God is calling this house, this place. God, may we be that house of healing and hope. When the scales fell off Paul's eyes and he could see again, it says he got up and was baptized. I remember that moment when I went from death to life. I remember from, from not seeing anything, from being blind God showing me the purpose of my life, seeing him clearly and being able to know him. And he didn't love me conditionally just because I did everything right. No, he loved me unconditionally and I could start to see his grace working through me. Woo, changed everything. Some of you remember that. Some of you have walked into this house, this room, and God has restored your sight. 
breathe new life into you. I can see again, or feel again, or alive again. Saul got up and was baptized, which shows going from death to life. It's represented publicly, which was happening in his heart, an external sign of an internal work in his life. In less than four weeks is going to be Easter Sunday. We're going to celebrate some great things that God's been doing in this place, in this house. So many lives have been changed over the last year. Just real quick, if God has done something great in your life in the last 12 months, just lift your hand high for me. Just Can you look around for a second? This is not just a testament of epic. This is a testament of how good our God is, right? Man, how faithful he is. So we want to celebrate God's goodness and what he's done in our house, what he's done in this church. This Easter, we want to celebrate that life change, doing it through baptism. And we're not going to do it down in the hotel pool like we have been doing it. We're going to do it right here with a big old pool of water. And it's going to be awesome. You guys remember Gallagher with the watermelons? We're going to have a splash section right here. We'll provide tarps for y'all. Because we're going WWE style baptisms this year. I'm going to be slinging them. Tombstone, Razor's Edge, right? I don't, I don't remember the moves. I don't remember. <laughs> Baptism right here in the room. We want to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus as we celebrate the resurrection of you. That God has brought you from death to life. You from being blind to now being able to see. What better picture of celebration could there be of Jesus coming back from death to life than him doing it in us? And we can celebrate it right here with all of our friends and family in the room with us. That we can stand up and say, man, God led me into a house and there he met me. There wasn't anything significant about the room, about the house, Right? There's nothing special about this room here. It's God's presence in here that's a meeting place between heaven and earth. Right here. It's where God kisses the dirt and breathes life into you and me. It's this house. We're going to celebrate that right here in front of us. If you haven't been baptized or maybe you want to be rebaptized, I'm going to encourage you to sign up. There's actually on your connection card, there's a little dot for baptism. You, I'll do it now. I give you permission to not pay attention to me for the next 60 seconds. You can check that off. We want you to sign up. We want you to invite your friends and family with us to experience this life-changing event. Baptism doesn't make you saved. It's just a, a symbol that what has already happened in your life. We barely fit into this room now. We've actually had amazing growth in, in Epic the last six months. Um, and so we barely all fit into this room in one service, and so we're going to be having two services on Easter Sunday, and uh, we're going to organize them well in place, the baptisms in, in each of them. Each service is going to have baptism, and so we'll be able to tell you which one you're in, so you can invite your family and friends to join us. Man, it's going to be the best Easter yet. <laughs> I can't wait for it. Uh, it's going to be amazing to celebrate what God's doing in your life, celebrate what God's doing in this earth through you, through us. In less than four weeks, this room is going to be full of peace people, believers, seekers, and skeptics. We don't know where they are in their journey of faith. We don't know where they are in, in, in their, their journey to God or from him. But we need to be ready. Because that moment, Easter Sunday, may be a meeting time between God and them. You know that person you had in your mind earlier? This Easter Sunday may be like this moment in Saul's life. They may wander into this room thinking they're seeing everything just fine and they're coming to support you and to celebrate with you. But maybe in this moment there's a meeting place between heaven and earth in their heart. And something changes in their life. It could happen in this room that that person you're thinking of, that person is far from God. So the strategy we've been talking about, we've been mentioning the next generation in our series and how we want to reach them. Week one, we laid out the strategy of what we feel we need to make that happen. The first week, we talked about having some curriculum, 
breathing life into these kids, setting an anchor in their hearts with the gospel that if and when they drift from God, they can only drift so far because the gospel of Jesus has been poured into them. So we want to empower our kids workers and our team uh, with curriculum. We talked about having an electronic check-in to be even more secure. Uh, someone wrote us a check at the end of that service and just said, hey, I got that. You, uh, you can cross that off. Praise God for that generosity for you guys. And we talked about having a part-time salary for a family pastor, someone that can empower the, the, the kids and youth teams that are already in place, that can strengthen them and empower them, help them to do what they do even better, take it to the, to the next level. So we talked about hiring uh, someone this year, a part-time salary. Last week we talked about city outreach, and there were no dollars to it because I know how you guys roll. If I said I want to I want to build a house right out today, you guys would be signing like checks like before I could finish speaking. You guys are so generous. Anything that has to do with outreach, you fund over and above. And so I said no, no dollar amounts because I know how you guys are. You're so generous. I said this is what I want you to do. I want you to get in a group so you can serve all the time. Small groups have one service project every semester. So three times a year they're doing small service projects. This year we have three big major projects where we are all going to combine together to do. And so I want you to be a part of those. And I encourage you to tithe. Regular giving. Set that reg regular giving up so we can know what's coming and we can take those dollars and allocate them to those service projects to make them the best and biggest we possibly can. As God sends Saul's into this house... What is our heart for this house? And this is the third and final phase of our, our strategy I want to talk about uh, for this series is this. The first is signage. We have uh, we found about $1,200 worth of signage that we think is going to benefit us. This building is not the easiest to find. Anybody invited someone to come and they couldn't find it and, and just left, right? Yeah, that's, that sucks. We don't want to do that. We want to fix that, right? Even when they get to the property, finding out where, where they're going to go when they get here is difficult. So we want to find some flags. We want to purchase some flags we can put out there on O'Donnell Street and so they can see it as soon as they turn in. They know exactly where they're going. Directional signs in the parking lot because even if you make it to the parking lot, you don't know where to park because there's a lot out here. There's a lot over there and there's a lot over there. So like, man, I don't even know where to go. So we want to find some, uh, we want to create some, uh, some directional signs for them in the parking lot. We've actually, and this is a little sidebar, we've been steadily improving uh, things in the hotel that the hotel can't get time to or doesn't have the budget for. And so I actually want to give some props to Josh. Uh, where's Josh at? Josh Hanshu. Where are you at? He's here somewhere. Josh has been going around fixing latches on bathroom stall doors. Um, he's been putting door stoppers in, uh, painting uh, things. He's been making sure there's nice soap in the bathrooms. Uh, he actually hired an electrician to come in and to fix these lights in this room so it didn't have the strobe effect while I'm preaching. Um, so we've been improving this place. And so some of that signage it actually is, is a part of this room as well and inside the hotel. Uh, secondly is parking team resources. We believe that there needs to be a team out there uh, in our parking lot building a team to be the first faces we see on Sunday morning. Our best and brightest directing first-time guests where to park because it's easy to get lost and to not know where you are. So we want people to be able to find this house. Jesus told them, hey, it's Judas on Straight Street. And we say, it's the best Western hotel on O'Donnell. And they're like, yeah, that's great. But I got to the parking lot. I had no clue where I was at. So I just turned around and, and went to Panera. I, you know, I just got some <laughs> breakfast. So we want the best and brightest out there, the biggest smiles and the biggest hearts. On our parking team, welcome us, so we want to uh, have some resources for them. And then lastly, uh, 10000 in AV and computer and tech upgrades. We rely heavily on technology. A, one, because it's, it, it's the generation in which we live, very technologically driven. Uh, but I also preach with a lot of visuals. The band has a lot of uh, lyrics and things that are on the screen. Anybody ever been thankful for the right lyrics on the screen at the right time? You know, that, that really helps, you know, it really helps. Those times where we have something burn up or malfunction right before service and there are no screens, we know it's going to be tough sledding that day because we're trying to get you to sing and you're like, I don't know the words to this song. Um, <laughs> it sounds like that too. We can hear you. We got cameras. 
all of this actually runs through a little Mac Mini, um, it's, and it's not adequate for what we ask it to do. Um, a few weeks ago, we actually had the countdown. Uh, die, the computer died right during the countdown, if you guys remember that. We, uh, week one of the series, the music's playing, boom, and she can bounce, and boom, and down, you know, people are coming in, shaking hands, high five, and yeah, church is exciting, and the computer went, <gasps> It got awkward for about four minutes of just awkward. It just told the band, just play. I know it's not time. Just go. And so the reason why we want to focus on these is because it's, easily, uh, it's easy for us to get distracted from the cross of Christ when these things aren't functioning properly. We want someone to see Jesus more clearly. And any distraction that keeps them from seeing Jesus more clearly, we want to remove it. And so we need to do some upgrades in our house, in this place. This house is the house that God's given us. We know it's not the most glorious or the best, but it's ours for now. And so we want to pour our heart into it. We want to pour our heart into this house. We want to prepare for whoever God may be sending us. Because in our presence every single week, God is changing lives. And this is a meeting place for people to know him, to see him, to find freedom, to discover their purpose and go out and make a difference. People are walking through our doors, some of them blind to the truth of who Jesus is. And so at the same time, God is empowering us, the people in this room, to leave. And they are leaving with scales falling off their eyes. People seeing life differently, seeing their spouse differently, seeing suffering differently, seeing their kids with a new perspective, seeing things brand new. I've got two stories I want to share with you guys this morning. Hope you can bear with us to, uh, to see these. I really want to celebrate uh, what God is doing in these lives. Check out this first one. Someone love dearly, Mr. Blackburn. Check this out. Uh, life before Christ was... Uh just going with the motions uh, every day, you know, life was just an up and down roller coaster. Honestly, about two years before Epic, a friend of mine, uh, Ricky Metzger, uh, invited me to his wedding, and we, me and my wife had been talking about going to churches, or going to a church, and all we known was the, you know, the old-fashioned churches that were up the street from me, and I met Pastor Chris at uh, Ricky's wedding, and I was like, you gotta tell me this cat's a, a pastor? <laughs> so uh, about a year later, a year and a half later, we, you know, me and my wife started talking, and then uh, we were like, we're gonna try this church thing. And, and you know, I was watching Chris's videos on YouTube, and um, I, I knew exactly where I wanted to go try, you know, my first time at a at a, a modern day church. Epic, you know, led me, you know, to Jesus. The, the, way, the way they do it's just so easy. I mean, there's no right or wrong way. You know, you just come and come as you are, and, and you know. You know, you take your steps as you want to. Um, there's no, there's nothing forcing you to do anything. There's no judgment against you. There's no eyes looking at you. There's no words behind your back. Everybody just reaches out to you and helps you in any way they can. Um, you actually look forward to going to church on Sundays. You almost don't want it to end. It, everything's easy laid out for you. The plan is there. If you want to follow it, follow it your own steps. My marriage has, has went from just going through the motions to almost better than anything any counselor could do for you, any any therapy could do for you. The old saying, what would Jesus do? That's always in the back of your head now, um, at least in my head and, and my wife's head. Uh, when it comes to parenting, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to our friends, when it comes to decisions we make uh, financially, um, it's just changed our life in so many ways that no textbook or computer you know, pro program or therapy program <laughs> could ever, you know, do, take the first step and, and find a church that teaches the Bible and, and, and for the questions start answering themselves. You know, when you have a pastor like Pastor Chris that, you know, I, I'll be stuck at 1230 on a, on a Wednesday afternoon reading my Bible at lunch and I stop right in the middle of the Bible because I'm, I'm stuck at this question or why is this happening like this and I got a pastor who can, you know, I'll text them or, or Facebook them and he gives me an answer. Um, I might not always like the answer, but, you know, he puts it in a way that I'm like, ah, that makes sense. You know, I can move on now. Um, I'd just like to thank Epic again for making it so easy. Um, the, the, the personnel that they have in place there are literally at your fingertips anytime you need them. Awesome. Let's give it up for Nick. <clears throat> now I got everybody blowing up my Facebook Messenger. <laughs> hey, PC, I always wondered about this. 
This, this is why we do what we do. Stories like this. This is why we give. This is why we sing and pray and learn. This is why we celebrate. This, this is why we do everything that we do because lives are being changed all around us. Lives are being changed in this room at this house. Let us never grow callous to the miracle that's happening in our midst. And today I'm going to challenge you guys to, to give and to commit to giving. We don't give to the church. We give through the church. By having a heart for this house, we are setting ourselves up to see more lives being changed, more Nick Blackburns, more the stories of families coming together and lives being changed and hearts being changed for Christ. So who is your why? I ask you to have someone in your mind. Everybody still have that person in their mind, right? That person you are thinking of, that person that keeps you working and keeps you moving forward, that, that person that's far from God, unsafe family member, wife, husband, wayward son or daughter, Maybe that sister or brother has no regard for God in her life. I want you to grab a card that you were given on your way in this morning. Uh, it says, this is why on it. Everybody get one of these in, the, in their bulletins. I want you to grab this card and this pen. I want you to flip it over to this white side. And in the top blank, first thing I want you to do with this card is I want you to write their name. First blank is why I commit to giving, my husband, my wife, my daughter, my son, write their name, Jim, Steve, Joe, they are why I commit to giving, you should be given a pen and a card on your way in this morning, I want you to grab that card, I want you to write that in there, next I want you to fill in what you feel God is leading you to give. Some of you are in a place financially that you can give a one-time gift. We are extremely uh, thankful for it. Uh, we call that an offering. It's over and above your regular giving. Some of you guys are financially blessed to where you can give a large one-time gift and drop that in. And we b believe me, that goes extremely far. Um, that takes us really far. Most importantly, I want to encourage each of us to give regularly. Scripture calls that tithing. A regular percentage, 10% is a biblical standard of giving in your income regularly. If you're not at the place where you can give 10%, start somewhere. Start at one, start at two and a half, five, wherever you are. And keep challenging yourself to give more and give more. I got one more video for you this morning. Uh, and during this video, I want you to take that card. I want you to prayerfully fill out what you feel God is challenging you to give today. And we'll wrap up our time. In just a moment, turn your attention to the screen. Check this out. I grew up in a Christian home, so I really didn't know life before Jesus. I was always ingrained in a life with Jesus. However, I grew up in a home where it was very rule-driven. Christianity was very rule-driven. So I struggled with that a lot because I couldn't follow the rules. Honestly, I just got to a point where I just stopped following him and ran from him which led just to continual sin. Um, I also struggled with myself, who I was as a person. I had a lot of body image issues because um, I was an overweight child and uh, my parents put me on diets from a very young age. Uh, I just felt like I wasn't smart enough or good enough. It actually led me to a life of dating women for 10 years, looking to sex and relationships to try to find um, approval for myself and for who I was. So my best friend encouraged me as I was just trying to find a church that I fit into, um, encouraged me to go to Epic for several months. One Sunday I went and honestly it felt like home. I felt like I was accepted right where I was and um, was given grace right where I was as I was trying to work through uh, what God wanted for me. I knew God wanted me to come back to him. I just didn't know how to do it. Since coming to Epic and actually um, coming back to God, I have completely figured out, you know, um, how to actually have a relationship with God. And it's not about what I'm doing. It's about um, walking every day with God in a relationship and that he has amazing grace, which I never felt growing up. I always felt like I had to live by the rules and be perfect. And if I wasn't, then he didn't love me. Um, God forgave me immediately when I asked for forgiveness for my entire past, but I took 
about two years to actually forgive myself. I think what I was going through, I had to hit, really hit rock bottom. And that's hard to say to somebody that you have to hit rock bottom um, before you, know, you really can rise up above and, and find God because that's really hard. So I think what I would say to someone is invest your time in God, take time with him every day because the more that I'm in the word and the more that I'm doing quiet time and prayer time, the more I want to follow God, the more I want to not sin, the more I want to um, have that relationship with him. So I would say invest in him and honestly be real with him. And also don't be afraid to seek help from somebody else because there are a lot of us that, that are going through the same struggles that you're going through and we're all here to support each other. I would say thank you Epic for letting me be me. And just thank you for loving me. I really believe that uh, Epic truly is a church for the rest of us and I've made some amazing relationships and friends there but they've just loved me right where I am and I think that that is so critical in, in walking with God to know that I'm not the only one struggling with you know, my body image or who I am as a person because there's a lot of people at Epic that are struggling with the same things. So I think it's, if anything, I would just say thank you for being real and thank you for just having grace for everybody. I get you to rise to your feet this morning. We're going to close out. Kelly is why we do what we do. What if there was no house for Kelly to walk into? What if there was no place that had a heart, an opening community to welcome her into? I want you to grab that card you were given this morning. And I want you to hold it high. I want everybody to hold their card up. Hold your card up. This is where the rubber meets the road. I'm asking you to commit this morning for a heart for this house. That we can see more stories like Kelly and more stories like Nick happen in our midst. The miracle of conversion, the miracle of God breathing life into someone happened in our midst. Have we grown callous to that? God forbid. It's a miracle where heaven kisses earth right here. So here's what we're going to do. The band's going to lead us in a chorus. I might ask you to bring your card up front. What you're committing to. I want to ask you to bring it up front. This is where the rubber meets the road. One-time gift, regular giving. I pray that God will bless you generously so that you can give all the more. But wherever you are, I want to challenge you this morning to give. As the band leads us in the song, I want to ask you to leave your seats, bring the card of what you're giving, and lay it up front here. Everybody cool with that this morning? You guys follow me? All right, here we go. I'm going to pray. They're going to lead us. I'm going to ask you to come forward, drop your cart, and go back to your seats. I'm going to pray for us before we leave out of this place. God, thank you for the generosity for us. Thank you, God, for your, your love and grace towards us. But thank you, God, for this house. That the lives that were changed are great and we celebrate them, but it's only the beginning. Because the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. So I pray to God that you give us the courage, the strength to be generous, to have a heart for this house so that these lives aren't the only lives that are touched. It is only the beginning. I pray for every person who has a card in their hand. Give them strength today. Touch their heart to give them a heart for the house and strength to be generous and to give with all that they have. We love you and thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you come?
We pray over you guys this morning and let you go. God, thank you so much for your goodness, for your grace for us. Thank you that our best days are ahead of us. Thank you, Lord, for being above all things, in all things, and through all things. I pray for every person who committed a commitment this morning, that you would give them grace and strength and empower them, give graciously to them. Pray all these things in your lovely name, Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Love you guys so much.